gonna make the are you gonna make the traditional braha before? I do not have that prepared, sister. Ah, uh, okay. That is fine. Yeah. We're not Orthodox, but we're just gonna start, <laughs> go ahead and uh, start the trumpet blasts. Amen. You know, we're Amen. not gonna have any warning when the, the great shofar blows. Amen. It's gonna happen. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and say the uh, tikiya. <laughs> Shavarim. Tara. Atikia Gedola. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, this your, mic right now. your microphone, <laughs> your system must have uh, noise noise dampening because we didn't get to hear all of it. Really? Yeah. Are you serious? Uh huh. Hear hardly any of it. You're kidding. Okay, that let me, let's try to fix that. That took a lot of lung power. Output level, microphone, Logitech, automatically adjust the microphone volume. Let's do that again without that. Let's. How about that? Yeah. I'm at. <laughs> Let me uh, get the settings here. Okay. Now, that is not easy. My wife is much. <laughs> uh, my wife is much better. Uh, at the woodwind instruments, she used to play the flute in a marching band. So, uh, praise God. It takes a lot for me to do that, but I want you guys to hear that. Amen. Amen. Is is <laughs> Rebbe Sensoria there? She is in the background. Come, in. Come on, say hi. Hello. Hi. Oh. Come blow for us. <laughs> Let me turn uh, the background off so you can see um, her. I need to bring chairs for us to be in here. Okay. Come on. This is, uh, let me turn off the uh, background real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. How do I do that? Sorry, guys. This is a technical issues we're learning mm, one second sorry i love the background but i don't here it is adjust background very there stately there we go <laughs> Office here, the first aid supplies behind us. Okay, guys, come on in. Here's a chair, so she made a chair. Yep. Rabbits and Saria, Hello. your husband. Hi, it's Sister Andrea. One second. Okay. Um, Rabbi Soria was bragging that you're a very good wind, wind, wind instrument player. <laughs> So I asked him to call you so you could blow for us. Okay, let me um let me take a drink and I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always causing trouble. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I let her do it in service. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> this is our friend Anne, our good friend Anne. I don't know if you can see it. There she is in the background, and she uh she is another tour keeper here in the valley, and she's a real good friend of ours and. Well, blessing to us. What are you guys making up? They're making traditional uh, cabin, uh, stuffed cabbage rolls? Cabbage rolls, honey cake, matzo ball soup, and uh, apples and honey. And, and, and Anne made some homemade challah. Yeah, and I did the round braid challah. She did the round braid traditional challah. And so uh, I'll take, once we're done with the study, I'll go kind of mosey on over there with the laptop and, and show you guys the goodies like that. So. Well, and this is Shoshana, our daughter. Hi. 
my baby girl. So she, Lovey, where's Lav? Oh, good. She's in the other. <laughs> I'll just uh, kind of go around and introduce everybody. Uh, so sister, up in the, I, we have the Brady Bunch screen here. Uh, so up in the upper left hand corner, the one you're talking to is Sister Andrea, and uh, Sister um, up in Canada. Oh, Canada. Okay. Yep. Praise God, and, and she, she's a. a Applying for a ministerial license. Okay. We have Sister Eurissa Gooden up in the corner here. Hello. Sister, are you in Oklahoma? Uh, Which state are you in? Yeah. She's in Oklahoma? Yes, I'm right on the border of Texas, Oklahoma. Oh, perfect. 60 God. miles from Dallas. Okay. Nice. I, uh, one of my grandmothers from uh, from Oklahoma. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sister Eurissa. I'm Oklahoma. in Bochita. Bochita. Well, that's wow. one of those. Definitely Oklahoma names. <laughs> Oak Mogies, things like that. I'm on Indian land. Oh, praise God. Okay. Well, my monitor just cut out for some reason. Give us, oh, there it goes. Uh, then we have here our Rabbi Jimney, of course, as we all know and love, in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Praise God. Good to see uh, Rabbi Jimney. Because a lot of times his internet connections it really, it's, it's hard to get a signal that we're asked, which is usually audio only. Uh -huh. We're blessed tonight to have uh, Rabbi Jimmy mm -hmm. in video tonight. <laughs> and and here we, go ahead, Brother uh, Rabbi Jimmy. Go ahead. Uh, this is Ann, my daughter. You already know everybody else. Hi, right um, well, how you guys doing? What? Um, this is Brother Charles over in Virginia. Right, Brother Charles? What's the town? Uh, what town in Virginia again? It's in Henrico, right north of Richmond. Henrico. There you go. Okay. Um, Richmond. My family lived uh, for that that area on the coast. I think they're back over by the north of Virginia, somewhere in between yeah. there. Right now, her uncle. I have family in Virginia, mm -hmm. right by Richmond. Oh. Wow. Praise God. And we have Brother Alexander here. And Brother Alexander, are you in Indiana? What state are you in again? Oh, shalom. Shalom. We're in Indiana. And my Praise wife. God. This is my wife. Hello. Hi. Praise God. And Hi. you all go to the UPC church out there, right? Correct? Yes. yes sir. Praise God. And Brother Jimmy goes to the UPC church over there in Lake Charles. Amen. Right. Wonderful. Excellent. Yeah. Well, great to have you both tonight with us. Oh, Lord. And so, um, you want to do this? Okay. Because I'm, I'm uh, She's really good. The she's pressure's better on now, so I'm going to choke. You, you the one, the three, and the pass. Okay. Well, let me say the blessing. I do have the, did pull the blessing up for the shofar. shofar. <laughs> The three good to do three. That's a ring to get the last one. All right, praise God, <laughs> hallelujah, amen. Thank you. Did you guys hear that one that time? Yeah. Praise God. I told you she was better than me. <laughs> I choked a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's really good at that, praise God. So welcome tonight uh, to our Rosh Hashanah uh, Bible study fellowship uh, celebration, however you want to call it tonight. Um, Rosh Hashanah should be a celebration. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Give me one second. Baby, can you go get Daddy a cup of ice water, please? I'm going to get into that mouth. Praise the Lord. So tonight is the first night of Rosh Hashanah. In the Bible, it's called Yom Teruah. Teruah means, uh, it could either mean a trumpet blast or it can mean a shout. Uh, it means both, really. It's the shout of the trumpet, the sound of the trumpet blast. Um, the biblical term is Yom Teruah. Um, but uh, later on, it became known as Rosh Hashanah, 
uh, amongst the Jewish people due to um, it being not the beginning of the year. Rosh Hashanah does not mean beginning of the year. It doesn't even mean New Year. It means head of the year. And so uh, it is the beginning of the fall feast. Um, we're all of the, the, the feasts and all the holy days in the Torah come to a head. And so, again, we've been going over the basics and going back to the basics in our uh, weekly Bible studies with the fundamentals of Judaism. And um, so I'm going to make it a point tonight to, to sort of cover things that may be old hat to you. Maybe you've all heard it already. It might be you know, nothing new to you as far as Rosh Hashanah. Um, but there are a lot of people out there that are still learning uh, the Torah. They're learning about the Hagim. They're learning about the Moadim. They're learning about God's appointed times and, and all of this. And so I'm going to uh, do my best to really make sure I cover from, you know, the, the more beginners to the advanced level uh, of things. But uh, in the Bible, there is two sets of feasts and, and appointed times, the fall feast and the spring feast. And so in the Bible, the beginning of the biblical calendar year uh, is in uh, springtime with the Passover, Pesach. And then we follow that up with the counting of the Omer. And then we uh, conclude that with the Shavuot, which is a Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. Then we have a long summer of really no biblical holidays or some rabbinic in there. And then we have the fall feast at the end of summer, um, beginning with this, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, we begin uh, the high and holy days. How many has ever heard that term, the high holy days? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Um, the high and holy days are starting now. We just got done with the month of Elul, which is the month of preparation for the high holy days. Um, God always does something special during this time of year. He does something special during the Passover time of year also. He does something uh, with Shavuot, obviously, with uh, you know the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Ghost. Um, but God really, really uh, does something in the Spirit during this time of year. And it's really profound. And it really happens, you know, whether someone acknowledge, you know, acknowledges it or not, or realizes it or not, because this is a holy period of time. Really, um, you know, there's a, I love Passover, I love Shavuot, and there's a lot, I, I love the Seders. There's, there's, but there's a different vibe, if you want to put it that way, it's a different spiritual vibe uh, from Pesach, uh, to the high and holy days. There's a specific feel uh, of God's presence and God's spirit for this time of year. Uh, these are called the Yamim Norayim, the days of awe. And that begins tonight and it goes through the week of repentance, the week of Teshuva. And really, it's um, you've got really two days of Rosh Hashanah. Um, you have from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, there are 10 days. Everybody say 10 days. 10 days. Indeed, uh, yes. those those ten days include the uh, the week of repentance, and in all, they're called uh, again the Yamim Norayim, the days of awe. They are days the, the days of awe, the days of splendor. Uh, they are a time of intense introspection and intense uh, teshuva, intense teshuva. Obviously, we we all believe in Acts two thirty eight. Amen. Amen. What's the Amen. first part? Who can tell me the first part? of Acts 2 and verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, Repent. and be baptized, every one of you. Amen. B'Shem Yeshua, and for the remission of sins. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Praise God. And so the beginning of Acts 2, 38 is repentance. We all believe in repentance. You know, none of us are perfect. We live for God as best we can, and we try to hit the mark, but we all miss the mark. And so we all have to make teshuva and repentance, you know, seven times 70 a day to stay right with the Lord. So we all believe that we should all repent every day. That's established. We all know that. But this time of year is a, is a time of much more intense, much more deliberate, much more intentional repentance. I mentioned it a while back. Uh, some of you may remember this. Some of you may have been too young. Some of you are not too young. But in the 90s, there was great apostolic rock revival in Ethiopia, if some of you could hearken back um, with Brother Tickle Merriam and things like that. I know that later on they had some doctrinal issues with whatever. But they had intense revival 
in the nineties with literally like four or 500,000 people getting together once a year for a huge, um, you know, uh, revival and, uh, hundreds of thousands of people getting the Holy ghost, like literally like in one service, hundred thousand people is, is amazing. Um, I think that was prophetic, but they asked, they actually came to the church, uh, that I was, uh, licensed in the ministry in, in Modesto, uh, where we still visit for the youth group, my, my daughter and, and our family, uh, about once a month or so. Um, Brother Tecklenburg came, and then later on, Brother uh, Tedessa came. I think it says brother or relative. But and all the Ethiop, a lot of Ethiopian Jews, or not, not Jews, they might have been Jewish. You never know, because um, there was a lot of Ethiopian Jews, the Falashas, Beta Israel. But uh, some of the Ethiopian Apostolic people came to our church. There were a lot there, and um, they basically let us know what the secret was of that revival in Ethiopia repentance it was to repentance and they did something that i had never seen any other church do either before or since like the, you know we had like two thousand people in our church in that service and they said okay it's time to rep-. you know we had song service we had announcements and you know greetings and this and that and he was teaching and preaching and said okay it's time to repent like 2,000 people in the service, including everybody, all the big wigs on the platform with the shirts and ties and the, you know, fancy clothes and all that. Everybody, so everybody, time to repent. The choir, the musicians, everybody. And so literally 2,000 people, you know, we, were, we had pews and so we just kind of turned around and kneeled at our pew. Everybody on the platform turned around and started praying on their, you know, chairs up on the platform. And literally for... You know, at least 20 minutes, everybody just started repenting and crying out to God for to forgive them. Just like that. Just All like right. that. And apparently in Ethiopia, this is like an everyday thing. This is like an all the time thing. They do this all the time. And this is the secret to the revival of hundreds of thousands of people you know, coming to the Lord in Ethiopia. And so I think it's amazing because really when people are doing that, it's really they're following this, this, the spirit and, and the, the idea of, of the high and holy days, praise God, which is a theme of repentance. Yes, we believe in Acts 2.38. We believe in the doctrine of repentance, Teshuvah, um, the, you know, the Jewish doctrine, the apostolic doctrine, we believe in it. But during this time of the year, we are repenting more intensely, more seriously, uh, more deliberately. And another aspect of it is we're not just doing it by ourselves in our prayer closet. We're not just doing it, um, you know, in our own personal individual walks with God. We're doing it corporately. We repent as a people. We repent as a body of believers. And we do, uh, we, we're not, this year we, we don't have the synagogue uh, building because we're getting ready to move. But, you know, when we do have the services uh, together in the services, we are repenting. And we will, we will, we will actually break out the, um, I do use traditional uh, Jewish uh, sidurim. Uh For these kind of holidays, it's called a machzor, which is the, the sidur for the high and holy days and for other holidays. Um, but uh, there is a special machzor for uh the high and holy days. And so there's passages in there. And I apologize. We are, my bookshelf is cleaned off right now. I have the books in semi storage. And so I don't have the Cedar right now. Um, but there are many, many, many pages in the Cedar in the Cedar where you can, you know, recite it aloud. And it, it is intense. It is an intense repentance and involves repeating the, 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 uh, the, uh, the verses of repentance and then beating your chest and really, you know, there's a, there's a lot involved with it. Suffice it to say that when it's all done, you really feel like you've just done something very intense before the Lord. It's not your everyday repentance. And so this is the beginning of that. Rosh Hashanah begins these days of awe. And so from now until uh, Yom Kippur, it is really our, our you know, uh, part of our walk with God based on the Torah. 
to focus on teshuva. No, and let me just say this also real quick. The devil really, really fights during the high holy days. In the spirit realm, there is great battle during this time of year. There's Amen. great battle. Um, the devil will really try to fight people to keep them from keeping the fall feasts. You say amen. amen. He will really try to derail your mind. He'll try to derail your focus, your attention, your walk with God, and really try to get you out of the mind of God and out of the spirit of the time of, of uh, the fall feasts. And really just, tr if, he, if he had his way, he would just get you completely distracted and you wouldn't even keep these, these, these holidays. So we have to take special, you know, attention and care to make sure that we do do these things, that we keep the the, uh, the appointed times of the Lord w during this time. Um, it's very easy to be distracted. What did Yeshua warn us about? The cares of life that do what? They choke out the word of God. Well, what was the word of God that they had back then? The Tanakh, Right. The Christians call the Old Testament. What's the the foundation of the entire Tanakh? What's the the the, the main uh, you know thing that the entire Tanakh is built upon? The Torah. And so, really, uh, the cares of life will try to choke out the words of God, and especially the words of the Torah. Especially these times, God, the devil wants you to just be distracted and say, you know what, I'm just not into it. I'm just not going to really. You know, I'm going to focus on, I'm just going to be, you know, out there with my mind and the cares of life of the world. I'm not even going to build a sukkah or something like that. There's a principle in Judaism that, let me just say this real quick. There's a principle in Judaism that essentially, like, you could study something like for a million years and have like all the book knowledge in the world on a subject, but you really don't know anything about that subject until you actually do it. So you can read like volumes and volumes of books on uh, Sukkot, but you really don't know anything about Sukkot unless you've actually gotten out there in your backyard, the side of your house, on your roof, wherever, on your patio, and you've actually built a Sukkah, a temporary uh, dwelling place. You could read a thousand books by a thousand rabbis on Sukkot, you don't know a thing about Sukkot unless you actually get out there and try to pitch a tent with three walls and try to put some sort of branches or you know tree uh, choppings on top and then decorate it and then sit in the Sukkah and rejoice before the Lord with fellowship and things like that. That's where you really learn what Sukkot is all about. I remember for the longest time, my wife and I, we lived in you know different apartments and things like that. And, you know, you always have, you know, other you know, tenants next to you and you don't really have your own backyard. You don't have, you're lucky if you have a patio. And so for the, the longest time, that was the most difficult holiday for us was to keep Sukkot because we had no backyard. And then finally we had a little, we were in a triplex. How many has ever lived in a triplex? God have mercy. <laughs> you know, Amen. you got a tenant on one side, we had a tenant on another one and we're sandwiched in between. And we have a little, maybe like eight foot by 15 foot patio. It was like tiny, you know. Um, and then we had other stuff out there, which made it even tinier, like, you know, washing and dryer and things like that. And so not much room. But I remember Sister Soria, Reverend and Soria surprised me. One day I was working in San Francisco, blah, blah, blah. I had to commute. You know, I get home one night and she had just taken it upon herself to build some sort of sukkah on that little teeny tiny patio. She has some really nice, like, I don't know what they were, curtains or blankets, I And she, one of the walls was the side of our apartment. Then there was the two, like, wood fence walls. And she put a thing over the top and put little, like, uh, lights around it, the string lights, and uh, had a little teeny tiny chair and a little table. And it was such a blessing that, you know, we had a sukkah finally to sit in on that little patio. So it doesn't have to be, you know, a huge ginormous sukkah. Um, I've seen, you know, sukkah contests where someone took like a, uh, it looked like a cardboard box that they deliver refrigerators in, refrigerators, wow. and they cut off one of the sides. So you still had three walls and the roof and they put a palm branch on the top 
in a lawn chair inside the box. And that was their sukkah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that qualifies as a sukkah. It doesn't have to be grand. You can use a tent. Uh, I've seen the craziest things. You know, uh, I talked about this last week, but someone took those plastic containers that you put two liter bottles of soda in at the store that they deliver the sodas in. Somehow they had like hundreds of them and they built up walls with these two liter soda container boxes around and they made a sukkah out of that. You know, the traditional rule is it just has to have three sides and a roof that's uh, got some uh, palm branches on it or some sort of tree branches on it. And so, um, and then you sit in it and you fellowship in it. And there is a piece to being in this. There is a special piece. I can testify, you know, from experience that sitting in the sukkah, once you've got it built and it, it's just such a beautiful thing. It, it is an amazing thing. It's, it's, there's such a presence of, first of all, you have the fellowship in there with other, you know, fellow believers. Then you have, Food and food's a big deal. I mean, the 70 elders went up to the Mount Sinai and ate food with God. They had a dinner with God. So, you know, you fellowship with other people. You have a meal and you relax and you talk and you enjoy the weather. You enjoy the, the, the last of the warm weather. And, and then, then there's a peace that comes into that sukkah. I mean, okay. I've taken naps in the sukkah. We have a cot and it's like, Wow. I mean, if it wasn't for our crazy neighborhood, I'd sleep out there all night, <laughs> you know, because the, the rest and that presence of shalom that, that comes to you in the sukkah is so phenomenal. And you're outdoors and in, in, in what God created. You know, I will say this is my pet peeve. Keeping Sukkot is not the same as going camping. Amen. You're not getting your, your uh, you know, Ozark trails and Walmart brand tent. <laughs> you're not and you're not going fishing and hunting and you're barbecuing out and just living out. that's not what Sukkot is about you know um, when Ezra kept Sukkot and they he revived Israel keeping the, the Torah you know they went out to the Mount of Olives got the branches then went back into the city and every man built their Sukkah by their house on the rooftops in the streets uh, of the city streets by your house um that was Sukkot. If it was about camping, Ezra would just say, hey, let's all go up to the Mount of Olives and stay out there for a week and camp out in the Mount of Olives. But they didn't. It's not about camping. That's more of a modern phenomenon. Really, it's only about 100 and something years old. So they took the branches back. They took all the butchy uh, boughs and, and, and branches they needed and the fruit, uh, and they went back to their homes and they built the Sukkah. And there's something special about it, but you don't really know what it's like. You don't know anything about Sukkot until you actually build something and try to do it. Amen. Everybody say amen. 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 Praise amen. God. So um, it all it starts today with Rosh Hashanah, um, the blowing of the shofar. Uh, it goes into the week of repentance and the Yamim Noraim, the days of awe. Self-reflection, self-inventory, really just trying to stay spiritually minded and repentance minded. Um, again, there is something profound. There is something spiritual that happens during this time of year. And I'm just going to say it. In the Holy Ghost, there is a portal that opens up during this time of year. And I don't care if somebody says they don't believe in Torah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't disqualify what God's going to do. It doesn't cancel what God does in the spirit. Amen. During the fall feast, especially during the high and holy days, a portal in the Holy Ghost opens up and it is connected. Number one, it's connected to two things. It's connected to revival and it's connected to the end times. It is a prophetic spirit. What are the feasts? The spring and the fall are both harvest feasts. Harvest feasts. The spring feasts are the harvest of barley and wheat. It is the, the, har the beginning of the harvest of the summer. It happens in springtime. It's the very beginning of the harvest of the springtime. 
what happened 2,000 years on this harvest day? Acts chapter 2. There were 3,000 souls that were harvested to the Lord that day in Jerusalem. They were baptized with the Ruach HaKodesh, spoke in tongues, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. That was a spiritual harvest. That was really what Shavuot is all about, the harvest of souls. Same thing with the fall feast. The fall feast are the in, the feast of the end gathering. It's the feast of the, the 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 last of the summer harvest, like Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving. You know what do we do at Thanksgiving? We get the pumpkin pie because you got pumpkins that are harvested and grown and harvested, and you got the the crops at the end of summer. Um, one of the end of the summer crops is grapes, and you know, grapes are harvested uh, at the very end of the year, uh, summer rather. Um, so you have all these different crops at the end of the summer that are. Uh, to be harvested, and that's what these fall feasts are also about, is this end of summer, uh, beginning of autumn harvesting. But it's not just about the physical food. There is a spiritual harvest also at the end of the summertime. I would say that maybe um, more on a, I don't know, mental level or something like that. We have summer vacation with, uh, you know, kids are out of school here in America, and they go back to school in you know September, August, September, the end of summer, beginning of fall. It has always been uh, here in America, anyways. That that shift from okay, just fun, relaxing times in the summer uh, to now we got to you know go back to school and, and things like that. There's sort of like a shift in mentality. Well, there's a shift in the spirit also. Praise God. And um, there's something that happens this time of year in the Holy Ghost. I'll just uh, give another testimony. The church that I, um, you know, mentioned before in Modesto, you know, they're not a, it's not a messianic uh, congregation. Um, thanks be to God, they're not anti-messianic either. Um, pastor by Brother Randy Keyes originally, and now it's Brother uh, Todd Johnson, Pastor Todd Johnson, uh, the UPC church there in Modesto, and which is a phenomenal church. Every year, We've had, since I've been saved in the 90s, uh, missions conference, usually in October. Always in October, actually. Now, I want you to get this for a minute. This is not a Messianic church. They don't really, I don't think they really know much about the fall feasts, uh, at least not over the pulpit, things like that. But yet, every year, there is a missions conference where missionaries from all over the world, all over the country and all over the world are invited and brought in to speak. And it's usually three days. And then usually back in the nineties, and I do this now, but back in the nineties and uh, early two thousands, we would always have special evangelists before and after come in and have, you know, great end time messages and, and revivals and things like that around the same time before and after missions conference. Um, and so every year at this time, without them even knowing it, you could feel the winds, the prophetic winds of the spirit move into that, to that space, into that, into that town, into the church. And it was just like clockwork. You could feel it in the Holy ghost. You could feel it. It was prophetic. It was, it was related. You could feel the revival, but you could also feel that prophetic end time spirit. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. Amen. Feel that in the Holy Ghost that you know the Lord's Lord's coming. You gotta get ready. It's the end times. You feel that intensity in a uh, uh, prophetic intensity in this in the Holy Ghost, and this happens every year. Well, it's no accident that that happens because they are doing these revivals at the same time that God is opening up a portal in the Holy Ghost because of the fall feasts. Amen. Amen. Praise God. This is the time of prophetic importance. The fall feasts, the high and holy days, in addition to having so many other meanings, um, we've got the <laughs> Teshuva, the week of Teshuva, the days of awe, that culminates with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And um, obviously Yeshua has already atoned our sins. 
but we can celebrate and look back. What is Pesach? We celebrate Passover and we do, we take, we have the Lord's Supper, the Messianic Seder, and we eat the matzah and drink uh, the yain, the wine, uh, Perea Gafen. We do that in remembrance of Yeshua. We look back to the cross. Well, we, can, we do the same thing in Yom Kippur. We look back to the atonement that you, Yeshua made for our sins. His blood was the, the, the mercy seat. Everybody say amen. amen. So amen. we have this intensity, this intense period of uh, teshuva. My wife and, and Anne have, are checking on the food because they got food cooking. So they're, they're back and forth between the uh, kitchen and here. Praise God. Um, then we have from Yom Kippur to from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur is 10 days. And then from Yom Kippur to Sukkot is five days. And let me just tell you, if you're planning on building a sukkah, you need to start literally like as soon as Yom Kippur is over, like literally, because it will take five days to get everything together. And, and the best thing to do is to try to have it built by, to really have it built by Sukkot. You don't want to be like wasting days. It's always a bummer. I've had years where things didn't go right. And, you know, you miss a day or two of sitting in the Sukkot. And it's always a bummer because once those days are gone, they're gone until next year. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. And so, the goal is to get that thing ready and built ASAP so that as soon as Sukkot comes, you can just relax and enjoy it. And that's the time of celebration. So we have you know, we have Elul and we have the Days of Awe to prepare. And it culminates on Yom Kippur with this sanctification of, of the day, the holiness, holiness of the day, holiest day of the year, repentance and the uh, remembrance and the atonement, we already have the atonement, but it's a more, you know, focused um, reflection of that that atonement. And then we have five days and we start to code, which is all celebration. All the holidays in the Torah follow the same pattern of preparation, sanctification, and celebration. You got that? Praise God. Elul and the days of awe, or the week of repentance, that's the preparation. You're getting your heart ready, getting right before the Lord. Then you culminates on Yom Kippur, which is the sanctification of the day. Um, it is a day to afflict your souls, which rabbis have interpreted as uh, meaning to abstain from food and water, to have a full fast for 24 hours. It's the only commandment in the Torah that commands you to fast. Even then, it is really not the, the word fast some reason is not used in the Torah fast as a song but uh, in that particular verse it says to afflict your souls um, David said I afflicted my soul with fasting so people kind of put two and two together um, that's you know how it's been interpreted there have been other rabbis that said well maybe it's not really talking about fasting you know maybe it's just talking about you know deep deep uh, emotional you know repentance and and feeling sorry for one's sins and things like that. But essentially, it's a fast day. Um, it's the only one commanded in the entire Torah. And then we have the, the uh, that's the sanctification aspect, preparation, sanctification, and then Sukkot is all about celebration. Amen? Amen. As soon as Yom Kippur is over, it is not time to wallow in the mire. It is not time to be sad and gloomy. And to be all of that, it's time to blow the shofar. It's time to rejoice. It's time to enjoy the blessings of God and fellowship and and just thank God for everything good he's ever given you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Um, Leviticus, uh, it all starts tonight, though. Leviticus 23 and 24 says, uh, speaking to the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh month today, and the first day of the month today shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Everybody say amen. 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 And so uh, the biblical term is uh, the memorial of blowing of trumpets. 
you know, Teruah, um, again, Teruah means the, the blast, the trumpet blast. Uh, it can also mean shout, which we'll get into some other verses that kind of correlate to that, a holy convocation. Um, it's the first day of the month. There's two days, you know, one for the diaspora, one in Israel um, altogether. It's also called the Day of Judgment, Yom Hadin, the Day of Remembrance, Yom HaZikaron, uh, and the Day of the Coronation of God. Uh, this is the time period that the year of Jubilee began. Now, let me just say this. There are people out there, Hebrew roots and other types, that are against using the term Rosh Hashanah because they say the beginning of the year is in the spring and this is not the beginning of the biblical year. It's the seventh of month. They're, uh, they're only partially right on that. The biblical year uh, does start. There's four New Year's in Judaism. Um, there's Passover, there's Sukkot, there's a year of trees, and I forget the fourth one uh, off the top of my head. There's four New Year's in Judaism. Um, and yes, Pesach is the beginning of one of those years, of really the biblical holidays. Uh, but this is also a different type of New Year. Uh, primarily, how many has ever heard of the year of Jubilee? Amen. Yeah. That's what Yeshua was referring to when he said he came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year, you know, when all the debts were forgiven, the slaves were set free. How many could use a little debts forgiven? I know I could. Hallelujah. No, 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 no. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I mean, can you imagine a whole nation having their debts forgiven? You, you're, you're, the creditors wipe out your account. It's all clean slate. Praise God. You don't have to stress over what you owe and this and that. And then, you know, the, 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 the slaves are set free and all that. Well, that new year, that Jubilee year, did not begin at Passover. The year of Jubilee begins in Rosh Hashanah. And actually, I believe it's on Yom Kippur. Technically, it's Yom Kippur. Um, but the year of Jubilee, that year, begins during the high and holy days. So for the Jubilee, for the release of debt, the release of slaves, that new year is now. So this is the new year for that. Praise God. It is God, also thank you. It's also a term used in Ezekiel. When Ezekiel got his divine uh one of his divine uh visions was right now. Let me read that. Ezekiel 40 in verse 1, in the 5 and 20th year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in Hebrew that is Berosh Hashanah, which is Rosh Hashanah, Berosh Hashanah, in the 10th day of the month. Can someone tell me what the 10th day of the month is during Rosh Hashanah? Which I just told you a couple minutes ago. First day is Rosh Hashanah, we go to Ruh, the trumpet blast. Ten days later is somebody Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. So Ezekiel is having this powerful, powerful vision where the God literally catches him away in the spirit. He's literally uh, harpazo. He's, he's literally raptured. Rapture means to take someone from one spot, instantaneously locate them somewhere else uh, in a second. Um, he's literally raptured on Yom Kippur, Berosh Hashanah, at the head of the year. And so we know that at least by Ezekiel's time period, this time of the year was called Rosh Hashanah. You say amen. 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 God. So don't let anyone like tell you, oh, you can't call it Rosh Hashanah. Uh, it's not the new year. Well, no, Rosh Hashanah means head of the year. There's a difference between a new year and the head of the year. So this is really the the most holy part of it. And the, the, where it comes to a head is the more the the head as far as like leadership and headship and and uh, the top of the of the of the pile, if you want to say that say it that way. It's the head of the year. It's not the new year necessarily, but it is the new year for jubilee. Amen. 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 Praise God. 
Year of Jubilee, um, acceptable year of the Lord, Luke 4 and 19, Isaiah 61 and 2. Um, praise God. Um, the week of repentance, that's really 10 days, the third day of the seventh month, last seven days and one week. Uh, it's also called Aseret Yemei Teshuva, the 10 days of repentance. It uh, begins with Rosh Hashanah and ends with Yom Kippur. Praise God. And so there is prophetic importance with this entire period of time how many love the book of revelation praise god love to study yeah. the book of revelation love it. it's our blessed hope you know it's it's cataclysmic events and they're profound and it's going to be scary when it happens a lot of it but at the same time it's a sign that it's almost over and the issue is about to return and the kingdom of god is about to appear physically and all of that the prof prophecy is going to be fulfilled and all that good, you know, it's the end times and, and it's about to wrap it up. The high and holy days are really all symbolic of the end times. Can you say praise God? Amen. Where did Paul, where did John, where does the entire uh, Chadasha, the New Testament, where does it all get this whole trumpet blowing business? Who can tell me? It comes from Rosh Hashanah. The whole theme of the day that the trumpet is going to sound comes from the Tanakh. It comes from uh, Yom Teruah, the day of the trumpet blast. Can you say praise God? Praise. Amen. Um, it comes from this holiday today. Now, you say, well, how did it go from just being the day that we're going to blow a trumpet to celebrate all these feasts, how did it you know, get involved with like the end times and this and that? That also has biblical Torah and Jewish roots. Praise God. How many know about the, uh, who can tell me, uh, well, I'll just tell you, this might be a harder question. One of the main themes of the high and holy days, especially of Yom Kippur, is the binding of Isaac on Mount Moriah. And Abraham was going to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. That's called the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. Amen. That is one of the main themes of Yom Kippur. What happens when Abraham goes to try to commit human sacrifice of his only child? The angel of the Lord stops him. The angel of the Lord. Thank God he stopped him. Bereshit 22 and 13 says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Can you say amen? Amen. It was amen. a perfect picture of Messiah with the crown on, on his head. Yes. Amen. Um, three days, three nights. Praise God, a hill of sacrifice. The Lord will provide his own sacrifice, substitution. This, this is the foundation of all biblical sacrifice. You know, um, I've heard preachers preach on sacrifice, and they always kind of come at it from the pain angle that sacrifice means pain. That's really not the biblical point of sacrifice. The biblical point of, of the theme of sacrifice is substitution. It's substitutionary. Uh, substitutionary. So, Isaac was about to be killed at God's command. And at the last minute, God stops him, thank God. And he provides a substitute, the ram caught in the thicket. And so instead of Isaac being killed, uh, the ram is killed. So there's a substitution there of who the victim is. And so really all, all sacrifice is based on that substitutionary aspect. And it culminates with Yeshua. You know, we're the ones that should have been punished. We're the ones that should have taken on the punishment for sins and the, the stripes and the beating. And, and we're the ones that should have, you know, you know, died and gone to Hades. You know, but instead, as a substitute, Yeshua took our punishment. He, you know, he was, you know, afflicted for our sins, our transgressions. You know, his blood was shed for our healing. All that he died for our sins as a substitute. Amen. And so the idea of Yeshua's sacrifice is substitutionary. Um, so Isaac being bound on Mount Moriah, about to be sacrificed. Instead, the ram 
is caught in the thicket by what? His horns. His horns. How many horns does a ram have? Two. Two. From this point on in Israel, those two horns became symbolic. And from that point on, prophetic. And they came to symbolize two great horns. Now, later on, when Joshua went into the Canaan land uh, and they took Jericho, Joshua 6 and 4 says, And the seven priests shall bear the before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the, the Kohanim, the priests, shall blow with the shofarot, the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the, the sound of the trumpet, the coal of the shofar, all the people shall shout with a great shout. There's the word shout. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So here we have the, in the classic tale uh, um, of Joshua blowing the shofar, blowing uh, the ram's horns, and you know, giving victory at Jericho uh, with the ram's horns. Uh, this wall fell down flat. You say amen. 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 Praise God. So the, the, the trumpets that they had at that time that the Jewish people have made are from the ram's horn. And for a kosher shofar, what they do is, you know, they have the, the, the horn cut off. There's some sort of cartilage in the middle of it where they boil it. They're able to take out the cartilage in the middle of that, sh that horn. And then, of course, they kind of like fine tune the rest uh, with a hole on one end. And then that becomes the shofar, the, the trumpet of the ram's horn. So going back to Isaac, two ram's horn means that there are two shofars. And these two shofars came to represent prophetic things in Israel. The first one was the shofar, the sound of the trumpet that was heard at a different mountain, not, which is Mount Sinai. They say amen. And that was the voice of the Lord that was heard when the Torah was given. Exodus 19 and 16 says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Verse 19. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. And everybody say amen. Amen. So what they were hearing was the pure voice of God. And it sounded like, what it's, the voice of God sounded like was a huge blast of a shofar. You can say amen. Later on, Israel, amen. Could not, they couldn't take it. It was too strong, too powerful, too much. I said, Moses, do you go talk to God and you tell us what he says. They couldn't take the pure voice of God. It was too powerful. But the sound was like that of a shofar. Praise God. That was the first horn of the ram caught in the thicket. The first uh, trumpet, rather. First voice. The first uh, shofar, rather. First shofar, uh, first horn of that ram represents the shofar heard in Mount Sinai. The second shofar Traditionally, within Judaism, the second great shofar that will be heard will be the shofar that sounds at the end of time. That will be the, the trumpet blast, the shofar, the sound of the shofar that will be heard around the world by God's people with the geula, the redemption. It's called in Judaism the geula, the redemption which Christians would call really the end time. They say, praise God. Praise God. 
Isaiah 27 and 13 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the great shofar shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So that is the great trumpet that is going to sound right there in Isaiah 27. Uh, Yeshua references this in Matthew 24 and 30, 31. And he shall send, this is Yeshua speaking here, about the end times, the last days, the Geula. And he says this. Let me back up one verse. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the sound of a shofar. Excuse me. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a shofar. And they shall gather together his elect, speaking of the Jewish people, from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. You say amen. Amen. So Isaiah calls it the great shofar. Here Yeshua says, with the great sound of a shofar, they shall gather the elect from the uh, four winds from one heaven, from, from one end of heaven to the other. So that is the trumpet blast that everybody's heard about in Pentecost. You say praise God. All right. So you know what that means, that there is actually a biblical holiday specifically about the day the trumpet's going to sound. Praise God. It's an actual holiday ordained by God celebrating the day of the trumpet blast. And that is today. Praise God. Let me read some more verses about this trumpet that's going to sound. 1 Corinthians 15 and 52 in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last shofar, last trump, for the shofar shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Revelation 1 and 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me the voice of a trumpet. This is John being caught up on the Sabbath day. Amen. On the Lord's day, on the Isle of Patmos, the Lord appears to him in a divine vision, but he hears the sound of a shofar, turns around, and it's Yeshua speaking. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. Uh, Revelation 4 and 1, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a shofar talking with me, which said, come up hither. And I will show you things which we must be here after. Praise God. So today is a day that symbolizes, I would say it's the rapture. And say amen. Amen. The catching away, the harpazo, the, now let me just say this. On uh, Rosh Hashanah, there are over 100 trumpet blasts, traditional, that are sounded. You know, in synagogues and things like that. Uh, on each day of Rosh Hashanah, Jewish law requires that the shofar be blown 30 times, and by custom, it is usually blown 100 or 101 times on each day. You say amen. Amen. So there's not just one trumpet blast for the day of uh, the trumpet blast, Rosh Hashanah. There are like 100, 101 trumpet blasts. In the book of Revelation, there are seven angels given seven shofars. So there's more than one trumpet blast in Revelation. Praise God. And so Paul references the last trump. Uh, so who knows? We'll, we'll get into this another time when we get into prophecy. You know, as far as when the harpazo could happen, could there be more than one shofar blast? Uh, perhaps one uh, for the New Testament people that are ready, uh, and then one for... The Jewish people that we saved during the uh, tribulation period, etc. There's a whole can of worms there, but it, I think it is possible that maybe there is more than one shofar blown. Uh, but there is going to be the great shofar, I believe, that will catch away 
Harpazo up people that are saved now. And say praise God. Praise God. Praise God. That brings, that brings questions, so yeah. many questions to mind that I won't bring up today, but oh boy. <laughs> it's a can of worms. It is a can of worms. The doctrine of the Harpazo is under attack, under attack. Um, so we need to be careful about that. Um, but there are many interpretations, and no one knows exactly what's going to happen. We all have our best Bible guess, or all try to get our best theology together, our best timelines, our best interpretations. Ultimately, no one really knows. We'll find out in the sweet by and by how it's going to all play out. Praise God. Um, but this entire time period, again, of the high and holy days is all prophetic. It starts with the trumpet blast, the day the trumpet's going to sound. There are major themes of Rosh Hashanah and of all the high and holy days. Uh, there are three major themes. The first one is the theme of uh, Machiot, which is royalty. And it's the proclamation of God as king of the universe. If you look at the book of Revelation, it essentially follows all the themes, all the major themes, uh, all of them, all the traditional and biblical th themes throughout the Torah, the history of Israel regarding the high and holy days, all the themes of high, the high and holy days are found right there, concentrated in the book of Revelation. So one of the themes of the high and holy days is Machiot, royalty, which is the proclamation of God as king of the universe. What do we find in the book of Revelation? We find that Mashiach returns, Yeshua returns. And on his thigh and on his garments is written a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Everybody say amen. Amen. So there's the theme of the kingship of God right there in the book of Revelation, uh, which is a the theme of Rosh Hashanah or of the High and Holy Days. Second theme is Zichronot, remembering uh, the proclamation of God, the master of the... Uh, as master of re remembrance and the judge of the universe. Uh, there is a part in Revelation uh, where the souls of, of people that have been killed for their testimony uh, of Yeshua, there's, their souls crowd from underneath, underneath the altar, and they say, how long, O Lord, will you, you know, wait to avenge us, essentially is what they're saying. And it's almost like God is remembering all these martyrs of uh, Yeshua that have died for their faith and died for their testimony. And there's like a remembrance there uh, where he's going to take vengeance on the world because of those uh, that martyred him there. Uh, the third uh, theme of Rosh Hashanah and the high and holy days in general is the shofarot, the trumpets, the proclamation of God who will sound the shofar of redemption. And that's really what it is. The shofar of redemption, the shofar of the geula which uh, Christians would call of the end times. Um, in a service, you would start the uh, parts of the, the theme of Machiot uh, as a declaration of Hamelech, the king, which is made at the beginning of the service. Uh, Hamelech means the king. And then there's a traditional song called Avinu Malkenu. How many know Avinu Malkenu? Amen. Amen. If, if you haven't heard it, I highly suggest that you just look it up uh, on, you know, one of these audio platforms or whatever. Uh, YouTube it. Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king. Again, there's that strong uh, kingship aspect there, the theme of kingship. Uh, Avinu, our father, our king, Malkenu. Um, and again, we find the, the theme of the kingship, kingship of God sitting on the great white throne of judgment, judging all the world in the book of Revelation. There are Midrashic descriptions in the second century that depict God as sitting upon the throne while books containing the deeds of all humanity are open for review and each person passing in front of him for evaluation of his or her, her deeds. Now, what does that sound like? Judgment. Sounds like the book of Revelation, but that is actually found also in uh, second century uh, Midrash. Praise God. 
Uh, Daniel 7 and 9 says this, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as a burning fire. You say amen. Amen. Praise God. Now that sounds a lot like uh, what we read in the book of Revelation, uh, but we find the great white throne there. We find uh, the king sitting on it. So again, these very, very uh, same things of the high and holy days. Can you say praise God? You can read that in Revelation 4 and 2. Um, and, and immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there's a rainbow run about his throne in sight like unto an emerald. He goes on and on. And so we find that theme in Revelation. It's an end time theme. Uh, Zichronot, God remembers all the deeds of every creature in the world and judges them accordingly. It's the proclamation of God who remembers deeds and judges. We find that at the end of book, the, uh, the book of Revelation. Um, the books are opened. Uh, traditionally in Judaism, there are three books of deeds. The book of life, Sefer HaChaim, uh, for the book of the righteous, and the book of the dead, Sefer, uh, the book of the wicked. Actually, it should be three. There's an intermediate group that has 10 days of repentance to become righteous. I'm reading my notes uh, that I took a while back. But traditionally, there are three books of deeds, and everybody say amen. <laughs> Praise God. These are the <laughs> traditional themes of, of the high and holy days. Praise God. I want to look at, and then the third one, again, is Shofarot, the trumpet of redemption. Um, or we have the two uh, trumpets of Sinai and at the end of the world. Praise God. And there are a multitude of, of references in the New Testament uh, regarding the Shofar. Let me uh, pull up another verse here real quick in Revelation. One second, let me get my Bible software here. Let me do that. One second. Anybody have any questions so far? Okay. Let's, um, so the book of Revelation, this isn't, I'm not really preaching on the, or teaching on the book of Revelation. I'm just trying to show you how that the, the themes of Revelation are all from the high and holy days. Um, now, we have the day of the trumpet blast. That symbolizes the rapture, the harpazo, the catching away of the body of Messiah out of this world. Um, after Rosh Hashanah, we have Yom Kippur, this day of repentance, uh, this holy, holy day, the day of affliction of the soul. And after that, we have Sukkot, which is the celebration. How do we keep Sukkot? Can somebody give me a few aspects of keeping Sukkot? Build the sukkah. Build the Don't sukkah. Build Praise God. Take up the four species. Take up the four species, and what we do? We bundle the when we bundle the support four species. What is it called? Lulav and esrog. Uh, Lulak and esrog. And for regular, uh, like Sephardic Hebrew, lulav and etrog, which is the bundle of uh, different species in Israel. The four species is three types of branches, and then the fruit of the land, uh, which is a citron, a citron, which is the original lemon. That's where all other lemons come from. In Hebrew, it's called an etrog. Um, but we bundle that together. We call it a lulav, which is really a palm branch. So what, the main branch in there, uh, there's myrtle leaves, 
uh, there are willow leaves, and then the main branch, excuse me, willow branches and uh, myrtle branches. The willow or, you know, beautiful weeping willow type, long and slender. The myrtle are supposed to be shaped like eyes, the smaller and like eye-shaped, bushy, a little bit bushier. And then you have the lulav itself, which is the palm branch. And it's really a palm frond, an unopened palm branch, which is the palm frond, which is straight. It looks like almost like a sword. Um, and so you bundle these together, and then you take the etrog, which is the, the um, fruit of the land, uh, this lemon, the original lemon, and um, you shake the lu you shake the lulav. Uh, and there's a certain traditional way to do that. But Sukkot is literally... Uh, a holiday where we worship God with tree branches and, and the fruit of the land, the produce of the land. Um, but the main, again, the main tree branch that, if you've ever seen a lulav, is the most visibly striking and the most visibly characteristic part of the lulav is the lulav, the palm branch, because it's the palm frond and it's straight. And it's, it's almost like a sword. So during Sukkot, that is the fall feast where we shake a palm branch unto the Lord to worship God and to celebrate. So again, back to the book of Revelation. Starts off with what? The sound of the shofar, the trumpet blast. In verse 1, he hears the sound of the shofar. That's Rosh Hashanah. Verse chapter 7, moving on. First he sees the great white throne of judgment. You can consider that Yom Kippur. And chapter 7 says, And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, that stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and with what? You can tell me what they're holding. Palm branches. Palm branches. They were holding palm branches. So, what's the holiday where the Jewish people worship God with palm branches? That is Sukkot. Amen. Praise God. Another traditional theme of the high and holy days, starting all the way from Rosh Hashanah, going all the way through, is the wearing of a white robe, which in Judaism symbolizes purity, but it also symbolizes the afterlife. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. And again, we find that also in the book of Revelation. Revelation Nine that I just read, they were clothed with white robes and lulavim in their hands. They had lulavs in their hands. And they were wearing the traditional white robes. Uh, verse 13 says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And he said, Praise God. Great. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Praise God. And so, again, a major traditional theme of the high and holy days found right there in uh, the book of Revelation. Praise God. And we can go into more... The, the tabernacle of God shall dwell with men at the end of the book of Revelation. That's what the tabernacle of God will dwell with men, referring to the physical body of Mashiach, physical body of Yeshua. That is the tabernacle made without hands, his physical body. It's going to dwell with mankind. But what is the Hebrew term for tabernacle? Who can tell me that? Mishkan. Mishkan. And also, if you want to say Feast of Tabernacle, Sukkot. You say praise God, two different words. Um, so we can see these themes of Rosh Hashanah, themes of Yom Kippur, the great throne, 
and themes of Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, all right there in the book of Revelation. So what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to uh, bring out here is that these holidays we're celebrating right now, they have a lot of different meanings, but they're prophetic. They have to do with prophecy. They have to do with the end times, with the Geula, the end of time when all these prophecies are fulfilled and Messiah returns, Yeshua returns. So these are end times related. They're related to harvest. They're related to end time revival. They're related to end time prophecy. So the return of Yeshua and to the fulfillment of all the things that we read about in Revelation, Ezekiel, Matthew, Joel, Isaiah, all these prophetic verses. This is a prophetic time of the year. And these are prophetic things that we're doing, blowing the shofar. There are things there that have, have to do with, with prophecy that are just profound. So praise God. Uh, and then there are also obviously the, the traditional meanings of these um, Rosh Hashanah being a sound of an, of an alarm to wake us up spiritually, Yom Kippur, Teshuva, and then we have Sukkot, which is rejoicing before the Lord. One of the main things, uh, one of the main themes of Sukkot is that um, it, it really is supposed to help us to understand and realize that everything in this life is temporal. Amen. Everything in this life is temporary, including our own bodies. And may God give each and every one of us long and healthy lives so we can be here for our kids and grandkids. Amen. Amen. So we can see the Lord's return. Amen. That would be so awesome. Um, but even if you live to be 100 years old, like Jimmy Carter, <laughs> <laughs> even if you live to be 100, eventually the body has to go back to the earth and we have to go, our spirits go back to the Lord and our bodies, even that tabernacle is temporary. So Sukkot is to remind us that everything in this world, uh, it's only temporary. You didn't bring it in with you, and you can't take it with you when you go out. Um, it's like the old song says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. How many remember that one? Praise God. Um, you know, it's very interesting, just my own personal life. Sister Sora and I, Robinson Sora and I, we bought the house we're living in right now in 2018. And it was a God thing. We weren't even looking. And a real estate agent that we had one contact with like six months before called us up out of the blue, said, we found a house for you. We didn't, like, we met him once and that was it. And they called us up out of the blue and said, we found a house for you. And they got us qualified and all that stuff. And we bought it exactly at the same time of year as right now. We literally bought it right before Sukkot. And I had already bought plane tickets to go out to Pensacola, Florida. Her sister Kathy had already, uh, her husband had built a sanctuary on the side of their house. So we had already had the plane tickets. We bought the house here. Then immediately... Before we we threw every, you know, unpacked our boxes in the garage, but we didn't even get to settle in or enjoy the house yet because we had to jump on a plane, fly all the way out to Florida, and then we dedicated the building there in in Pensacola and celebrated Sukkot with Sister Kathy in Florida. And as soon as that, we were there for like I think three days. As soon as that was over, we flew back. And then got to really move into our house and start unpacking boxes and enjoy our new home. What's well, amazing that I did not plan this, people. I did not plan this. It actually popped up on our Facebook memories today. Today, when we signed, today is the day when we signed the papers for this house back in 2018 and then celebrated Sukkot, which is about temporary housing. I forgot to mention the original meaning of Sukkot is that it commemorates and memorializes the temporary booths 
that Israel had to live in as it left Egypt and you know, stayed in the desert. They stayed in booths, Sukkot. That was the first place they landed. In Sukkot, yeah, it was the first place, tabernacles. Sukkot were also like animal stables. So when the, when the Torah talks about, when the New Testament talks about Yeshua having to uh, be born in an animal manger, well, uh, Sukkot is also an animal manger. It's actually used, I think, in Chronicles or, or the Kings there, where it talks about uh, the animal herds, um, what they were kept in, is Sukkot. So more than likely, Yeshua was actually born in at this time of year and born in a sukkah. They say amen. 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 That, it explains why they were traveling. Yeah. And the the uh the shepherds in the fields. Yes. It's too cold in the winter for them to stay outside, but Sukkot is the last of the warm weather. Amen. Amen. And so uh, it's it, it's very possible that Yeshua was born in a sukkah. I mean, maybe probably right before or right after or something, because other people were staying in the hotels and everybody would have been staying in the Sukkot. Um, but still, it was probably around Sukkot. Um, but the original meaning of Sukkot is when Israel was having to live in these tents and these booths, the portable makeshift temporary dwellings in the desert. But what, what happened there? Remember, their shoes did not wear out. Their clothes did not wear out. God provided. They were in a dry desert where you can die of thirst from no water. What did God do? He provided Miriam's well uh, in a rock that literally followed them around the desert and provided uh, an overflowing of water for them to drink. God provided quail from heaven, manna from heaven. He provided for the shoes and the clothes on their back, the food that they ate, and then the housing that they dwelt in, these temporary Sukkot. So the major theme of Sukkot is God's provision. It may seem like you ain't got two pennies to rub together. It may seem like things are a, a dollar late, a day late and a dollar short. It may seem like we're always in need or, you know, and, and things are happening. We're where is it going to come from? How is it going to be? How is God going to provide? But he comes through and he provides just like he provided for the children of Israel in the wilderness. And so Sukkot is a celebration of God providing everything for us, our food, our clothing, our housing. He will provide. And so it's a celebration that God will provide. So one year ago today, my wife just saw it. It popped up on her Facebook is when we signed our papers. And it's amazing because I didn't plan this at all, at all. <laughs> now, at that exact same time of year, we're selling our house and moving out to the Gulf Coast. You say amen. Amen. Which really, to me, drives home that you know, even this house that we purchased, it's only temporary. Everything is temporary. The right. aches and pains in your body, thanks be to God, are only temporary. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You know, this old achy body or young body, whatever the case may be, it's, it's temporary. Praise God. We have a home on high. We have a new body that we will get when the trumpet sounds. When the shofar sounds, we'll get a new body. Praise God. But this one's temporary. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Praise God. And so those are the major themes of the high and holy days. It all has to do with, with you know, all these things about God's provision, the temporary nature of this world, and also with in time events. It's a prophetic holiday. It's a profound holiday. It's also tied into harvest. God's spirit moves at this time. There's a great anointing of soul winning upon this time. Praise God. And so let's tap into that. Can you say amen? amen. Let's tap into that. Now, I didn't get there. Traditionally, uh, the way we celebrate Rosh Hashanah, um, I usually put up on, online a cheat sheet um, for, for Rosh Hashanah. Um, it is, as I explained before, it is one of the biblical New Year's, which was the year of Jubilee. 
Amen. Amen. And so Amen. the traditional greeting for this time of year is Lashana Tova, which means uh, a good year for a good year. And uh, so we're really wishing each other that uh, we have a good year going forward. There's some very, very heavy parts of the traditional Yom Kippur liturgy. And, you know, it's it's pretty heavy. I mean, it's it's talking about we don't know who's going to be here next year. God can take some of us and some might be here and some might not be here. It's a very heavy service. You know, um, so there's that aspect to these holidays, but there's also the aspect of it being a new year. So we want to wish people a good new year to come, that he'll bless on us as in the good years. Amen? Amen. So that we will have a good year. <laughs> Amen. Uh, that we will have a good year that we'll all be here next year. Blessed, healthy, uh, prosperous, and all that good stuff. So we wish each other the Shana Tova, a good year. Praise God. And uh, we celebrate uh, with things like normally we make a uh, challah that's braided, which goes back to the tabernacle, 12 loaves of bread, 12 braids, two loaves of six braids each. But during this time of year, we make it what's called the turban challah, which is a round challah. It's, it goes... It's, you need this looks like a turban around, almost like a giant cinnamon roll. Um, or some people braid it in a circle. And there's a lot of different traditions, but it's, um, and that symbolizes the cycle of the year. Praise God. And so the Torah um, passages uh, will begin anew after the holidays. The Torah portions, the parshiot, will begin anew. They culminate now. Uh, they're finishing and they will start again after the High Holy Days. So it's the cycle of time. Judaism and the Torah, more importantly, the Torah itself, is all about the sanctification of time. The older I get, the more I value time. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. When you're young, Amen. you really take time for granted. Uh, it's very easy to take time for granted when you're not young. But when you get older, you realize every day counts. Every day is a gift from God. Every second that we can be with our loved ones is precious. And so time is precious. And the Torah teaches us that we should sanctify time. And there are biblical times to sanctify. That's what the, that's what the Sabbath is. It's a sanctifying time. All the holidays, Passover, Pentecost, um, Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, all of these Sukkot are sacred time. It's the time that we have to sanctify. If you don't do it, it'll come and go and it'll be gone and you'll miss out on the blessings. Amen. This time period. But if you tap into it, you rejoice, you will receive the blessings in and of the holiday itself, in and of the sacred time. The Sukkah is a combination, really. I in my own personal experience, the sukkah is a combination of sacred time and sacred space. So it lasts for eight days. Uh, you have the sukkot, and then you have uh, Shmini Atzeret, which is a solemn assembly at the end. And then you have Simchat Torah, which is the joy of the Torah, rejoicing in God giving us the Torah. Um, so there's sacred time there. But then you have, and, and the Shemini Atzeret is the calling of the Solemn Assembly. That's what Joel's referring to. Again, very end time related. It's related to the end time. That's when Joel says, sound the alarm in Sion. Blow the shofar. Sound the alarm. Call a Solemn Assembly. A Solemn Assembly is, is the uh, Shemini Atzeret. That's what it is. It's a Solemn Assembly. And so it's prophetically related also. But there's that sacred time in there. But then there's also that sacred space. When you build a sukkah, however big it is or however small, it's such a precious space. It's amazing how just some tarps and blankets or tapestries 
and decorations and tables, you sanctify that area. It really turns that space into something special. I get a little bit sad every time I have to take it down. <laughs> be honest with you, it's almost like a vacation has ended. And it's like, oh, gosh, we got to go back to regular life. It's such a downer. I get a little bit sad when I have to take the suka down. Um, because it's so, you just really love it. You really get attached. So it becomes more than just sacred time. It's, it's the time aspect. But also, it's that little hut that you live in. You you eat, you drink, you fellowship, you relax, you enjoy each other's company. It's just a it's a blessing, and it really becomes a special place. You worship the Lord, praise God, wave the lulav, look up at the sky, relax at night, all kinds of stuff. It becomes a precious dwelling place. So really, Sukkot is also about that sacred area, that sacred space that you create unto the Lord. This is all unto the Lord. Giving thanks to God, praising God, rejoicing before the Lord, fellowshipping with people of God. It's just a blessing. So this is all leading up to that. Preparation right now, sanctification, Yom Kippur, and then celebration during Sukkot. It's the high holidays. It all starts now. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Um, Sister Robinson, sorry, is the food ready or no? Okay, I'm going to take you all on a tour real quick through our house. And um, see how I can do this. I'm going to. Is the suka supposed to be here? Let me help yourself. I'm okay. Hold on. <laughs> you guys still see me? Yep. One second. Hold uh, on. What happened? Your screen is black. My screen is, there it goes. It took a minute. One second. You, all, you guys are all mobile now. <laughs> Your camera. And I am going to, I'm going to carry the high def camera. <laughs> One second. Put, carry the camera. On is it all ready out there? Okay, guys. Hi, don't mind me. You can walk through our house, which is in presentation mode. No, I'm not giving you like, Most everything is packed. What's that? So most everything is packed. Yeah, but even, our house is ready for, it's staged right now and everything, so. Praise God. Baruch Hashem. We have and traditional. The Here's the uh, beautiful Braided round challah. Good job, Ann. Praise God. Um, the turban challah, nice and braided for Rosh Hashanah. For all the high holy days. So my wife's a good kind of out. We eat um, apples dipped in honey for a sweet New Year. You can say amen. Amen. I'm trying to get the right angle. There. Um, honey cake. This is honey cake right here. Rebbe Tensori actually got a really good recipe from a Chabad for that one. Hold on one second. That's from Chabad, wasn't it? Yeah. But that's, that's a, our oven broke, so that's a store book. Okay. And here's the honey. The honey in that little bag there. Right there. That's there the honey. Go. Oh, there it is right there. And so you dip the apples in the honey for a sweet new year. And oh, we go over here. The kitchen. We have a little pretty friend joining us today. Okay. Um, matzo ball soup. In the crock awesome matzo ball soup. My wife sent some really over. Send some over. <laughs> really good matzo ball soup. It's delicious. We're actually selling it uh, to so, some of the local. It's a little dark because our oven. Uh, broke, so we have to do everything in a perfection oven. <laughs> it's usually a little bit lighter, but it's going to be still tasty. This is um, stuffed cabbage rolls with beef and rice. It's delicious. 
And so we're going to uh, rejoice today. And um, let's sound the show. I usually like to go and sound the shofar on the patio or something like that. So all the neighbors can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, and there's, there's other themes like pomegranates and things like that. Um, but it's all about having a sweet uh, new year and uh, celebrating and say praise God. Praise God. Praise, God. praise the Lord. Well, I, I wish that um, we had some sort of like Star Trek technology where I could just like beam us over beam us beam you guys some of the food <laughs> yeah <laughs> praise god um but um we'll just have to do right now with the video praise god so praise god i hope you all have a wonderful um rosh hashanah and everybody should be in preparation uh for that concentrated teshiva coming up but uh, also for the celebration coming with sukkot amen Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, I hope everyone has uh, a wonderful uh, remainder of your evening. And, uh, you know, if you don't have a full spread, just do something to rejoice and maybe get something special, you know, that you can afford and whatnot to make the day special and uh, celebrate the new year coming in uh, with the um, Rosh Hashanah. Amen. 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 Shana Tova to everybody. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. God bless you. Shana Tova.